This is Australia's biggest photovoltaic solar farm. It's in the Riverina in New South Wales. If you take all the panels and put them one next to the other, you'd get a distance of 1,100 kilometres, which is the equivalent of the distance from Canberra to Brisbane. So it's huge. Massive. Renewable energy projects like this are springing up all over the country as Australia tries to cut its emissions. You might think this explosion of renewables is the sole solution to reducing Australia's carbon footprint. It's not. Electricity is only one contributor to our greenhouse gas emissions. And across the rest of the economy, the challenges are huge. What about transport? What about agriculture? What about other industries? We need an overarching emissions reduction strategy. If you look around the world and compare what is going on in Australia, we've been quite surprised actually at just how far behind the country is. Tonight on Four Corners, we investigate Australia's efforts to help curb global warming and ask, are we doing enough? Here in Tarthra on the Sapphire Coast in New South Wales, the primary school hall is filling up fast. Nearly 250 people have turned up to decide what they can do to combat climate change. I've been a believer or an acknowledger that climate change is real and has been real for a long time and I do think that we've got a responsibility to do something about it. We think that our politicians aren't doing sufficient as far as climate change. It's almost there's a big denial. I'm really detecting a very strong mood for change in regional Australia. Um, Local like doctor say, Matthew Knott is leading the charge. People really searching for leadership on climate change, but also, particularly in regional areas, appreciating that uh, renewable energy offers us a huge economic opportunity. That's what tonight's all about, economic opportunity. I hear the excuse all the time that Australia is only worth 1% of global emissions, so why bother doing anything about climate change? In Tarthra, my back of the envelope calculation tells me that we're worth about 0.00005% of global uh, emissions. Um, <clears throat> so we're a very, very small part of the problem, but we want to be a big part of the solution, absolutely. We want to uh, show leadership on climate change. It means we're going to have to look very carefully at energy conservation. Uh, we're going to have His community group is pushing for the town and the Shire to fully embrace renewable energy. I am now proposing that we have a vote on a 100% renewable energy target by 2030 for the Bega Valley Shire, starting right here in Tarthra. Can we have a show of hands for those who would support that motion? Thank you very much. Uh, anyone object to it? <laughs> we have an objection. Uh, would you like to have a word? Uh, 2025. <laughs> so I think we can uh, declare that motion passed. At our meeting in Tarthra, we also put it to our community that we wanted to paint the water tower in Tarthra with that target. I think it will give Tarthra a sense of pride that we are leading the way nationally in Australia when it comes to climate change solutions. Climate change has been on the minds of many here in Tarthra since parts of the town were destroyed by a bushfire last year. 
Scientists have long warned the risk of extreme weather events will increase as the planet gets warmer. Right now, global temperatures are projected to rise by up to three degrees above pre-industrial levels. By the time we get to three degrees warming, I think we'll have a continent that is ecologically transformed. It won't be like the continent in which uh, many of us grew up in. Uh, summers will be uh, a, a time to fear, I think, particularly around southern coastal regions, uh, rather than the time that they are now for people to enjoy themselves. And what we've seen over the last summer is just the beginning of that. We're only at one degree warming now. I think three degrees, you think a lot more. The world's current plan to slow global warming is the Paris Agreement, signed by more than 170 countries in 2016. Under that deal, Australia pledged to reduce its emissions by 26% from 2005 levels by 2030. But right now, there is furious debate about whether Australia is on track to meet that target. Morning, everyone. We will meet the targets that we've set out for ourselves when it comes to emissions reduction. The Paris commitments. Carbon pollution has been rising since this government came to office. Australia's emissions, Australia's 1.3% of global carbon emissions. They're right. up by 0.9% over the year. the year. Well, they are coming down right now, Barry. We're going to meet those in a canter, our 26% target. Think we'll meet I, in a canter. I, I do, Barry. I do. The punter is saying abandon the Paris Climate change targets, will you do that? Thank you very much. And in spite of the Prime Minister and all of his ministers getting up at this dispatch box and doing media conferences to say that we're going to meet our targets in a canter, no one believes them. Last December, a Department of Environment and Energy report found Australia's emissions in 2030 are projected to be 7% below 2005 levels, not the 26% the government's promised. Australia is definitely not on track to meet its Paris target. Scientist and policy analyst Bill Hare has co-authored reports for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The government's own numbers would say that the emissions are headed way above the target and that there's no way with present policy uh, settings that the government has, even the new ones, that it will come anywhere close to the target. We can meet that target, but it won't happen automatically. And in fact, we can meet a much stronger target if we really put our shoulder to the wheel. Most of Australia's carbon emissions come from four areas of our economy. Transport, industry, agriculture and electricity. Transport makes up about 19%. Nearly half of those emissions come from cars. And they're rising. Transport emissions keep going up. Why is that? Well. Population is growing, transport needs are growing, and the efficiency of the vehicle fleet is not improving sufficiently to offset that. Australians love their cars. That affection is on full display here at the annual Ute Muster at the Oberon Show west of Sydney. We got um, 36 Utes, which is a really good roll-up. We've had one bloke travel 10 hours from Inverell to come all the way to Oberon for the show. It's a good day, all that day. People spend a lot of time on their cars, as you can see, you know, and uh, yeah, just have a good time. Start down the bottom here, the FJ Ute, and then you go, you just go through. Charge of one to ten. So there's your numbers of your vehicles. The competition is serious. Tags, got the tags. Yeah, hanging up in the mirror. 
Doğru. Eski yep. Swag yep. Korkusu mu şu? Yep in the middle. To work? Yep. Well, I'm a bricklayer, so I need something that holds weight. Uh, specialised suspension holds 1.2 tonne. Uh, steel tray, uh, like almost like a light truck tyre. Do you know how it is in terms of pollution, carbon pollution? Oh, it's probably, probably not, 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 not all that good. <laughs> Why do you like having a car like this, a big car? A V8, because it's a V8. It's an Aussie thing to do. Um, it's, it's all I've owned all my life for the last 30 years, is V8s. It won't change. How do you think it goes on the carbon dioxide emissions levels? <laughs> uh, where do I laugh? Um, yeah, nah. Yeah, um, she, yeah, she does blow a lot of smoke. <laughs> We're a big country with a big driving culture and particularly in outer suburban areas and the regions, we like big cars. So SUVs are certainly the largest selling cars in this country and, you know, people love their big cars and in those areas we tend to turn over them much slower. We have a very old fleet in this country. We are global laggards when it comes to our efforts to reduce emissions. So when we look at the US, particularly when we look at Europe, their vehicles are more efficient than ours here. One of the most obvious ways to have fewer gas guzzlers is to introduce what's called an efficiency standard. Having one would force manufacturers to sell a larger number of fuel-efficient cars. <laughs> We're one of the only countries in the developed world without that CO2 standard. Unfortunately, the matter of having a CO2 standard in our transport system has become a bit of a political football. The federal government recognised the need for us to implement one and started a process back in 2015. And then when, they, when their own department made a recommendation for them, they were attacked by their own, the far right of their own party. It was called a carbon tax on cars. Other countries are going even further, phasing out the sale of new petrol and diesel cars. Do you think Australia should do the same? I absolutely think we should do that. What date do you think Australia should put on banning the sale of petrol and diesel cars? I think the Australian market's got a bit of catching up to do from where we are at the moment. So, if anything, our targets here need to be a bit more aggressive than what we're seeing in, in other markets. So I would expect to start seeing targets that are between 2025, 2030 for banning, elect, uh, banning petrol driven cars in this country. For these car lovers, a ban will be a hard sell. Can you see yourself ever buying an electric no. car? No, no way in the world. Why not? Couldn't do it. I like my fuel. I'm like, no, it'd be weird. <laughs> I'd have to have long hair and have a man bun. I'll pass. <laughs> like it or not, electric vehicles or EVs are where the rest of the world is headed. But Australia is streets behind. Electric vehicles last year in Australia were 0.2% of new cars sold. I think that's embarrassing. What we're looking at here at the moment is a big transition for the industry, automotive in general. I think specifically within Australia at the moment, we lack direction. And direction really being led, I think, by the government would help and support us. At this car showroom in Melbourne's east, there are plenty of petrol and diesel cars for sale. The only electric car on the lot is the one you can't even buy yet in Australia. So when's this coming out? So we'll have this in Australian shores by mid-2019. Mm -hmm. We've got a few here actually in the country already that we're using um, to share with government, to share with fleets. So how does it work? It's the top-selling electric car in Europe, but Nissan's delayed bringing it here because there's so little demand. 
We've had to reassess our strategy and wait a little bit longer than we probably would have expected to bring the second generation LEAF to the market. Without that direction um, from government, I think all manufacturers struggle to understand how quickly they can bring new offerings into uh, the country. When we look at the UK, for instance, which is a large right-hand drive market that really influences our own, they have about 29 models of electric vehicles priced under $60,000 Australian. In Australia, that same number, we have about four models in that price range. At the moment, there are only about 7,000 electric cars on the roads here, and fewer than 800 charging stations across the country. If anything, we've seen barriers and disincentives to electric cars. So we haven't seen the support or investment in infrastructure. I'd love to see government making more commitments around their own fleet. And I'd love to see more support for the infrastructure going in so that we've actually got the charging networks in place. The government's recently set aside $400,000 to work on a national strategy for electric vehicles. The industry body says the plan is unclear, underwhelming and lacks urgency. The global market has already told us we are banning petrol and diesel vehicles and moving towards electric ones. This isn't a decision that's left for us to be made anymore. The only decision that's left for Australia is, are you going to get coordinated about this rollout or are you going to wait to happen, for it to happen to you and complain about it later? The second biggest contributor to our emissions is industry, the greenhouse gases that come mainly from manufacturing and extracting and processing resources. They make up about 30% of our emissions and they're rising. That reflects increasing economic activity, which on the one hand was positive, but on the other hand, the rate of improvement of energy use and carbon intensity in our industrial sector, broadly defined, is at the bottom end of the world standards. We have fallen a long way behind. One of the main drivers of industry emissions is our exports of liquid natural gas. This is Gladstone in Queensland, where three LNG plants have come online in the last five years. Australia is now the world's biggest exporter of LNG. So this is our fire water facilities, and uh, we've got two fire water tanks at the, uh, I guess it's the north end of the plant. This plant is operated by Australian company Santos. Kevin Gallagher is its CEO. So those are our LNG storage tanks, and you can see... How the gas is pumped from fields 420 kilometres away. Here, it's liquefied, ready for export. Well, once it goes on to our ships here, um, the gas goes off to our Asian buyers, our Asian customers, um, and uh, uh, that's in, in Korea and Malaysia. The LNG sector is growing its emissions during this period because we're ramping up the industry as all of those big LNG projects come online. The demand in Asia is driving um, that growth in LNG because uh, of their desire to replace coal in the future energy mix with gas. When burned to create energy, gas is cleaner than coal, which is good for the countries that buy it. But extracting and liquefying it here in Australia is pushing up our emissions. The proportion of Australia's emissions coming from the sector have grown quite a lot and will continue to do so for the next five or ten years as more plant come online and the existing plant reach maximum production. The holy grail for reducing emissions in the fossil fuel industry is carbon capture and storage. CCS, as it's known, involves capturing carbon emissions and pumping them into underground storage. The industry's been talking about it for decades, but in Australia, it's still not a reality. Why is it taking so long to get carbon capture and storage working in Australia? Well, look, uh, because it's expensive, um, because, because the technology is, is unproven um, and um, uh, it's been bitty, I think, you know, in terms of the, uh, 
the, um, the, the commitments and, and the, uh, the, the efforts to do it in the past. Santos first set up a CCS project over a decade ago, but stopped it after two years because it was too expensive. Amid mounting pressure from investor groups to act on climate change, the company's starting a new trial this year. It has been 10 years that we've been talking about carbon capture and storage as the solution to reducing emissions in this sector. It's still not working. What's the backup plan if it doesn't? Well, look, I mean, I'm confident it will. I mean, when you look at the, the commitment of... Is the that a guarantee? Oh, look, you can never guarantee anything, but, but the fact that we're spending this money... But what if it doesn't? Money, well, I think the fact that we're spending the money we're spending, we wouldn't be investing that if we didn't believe it would work. I've grown to become more and more sceptical about CCS as a solution, even for these industrial sectors. While the fossil fuel industry here struggles to make CCS work, there's another problem. Right now, the government essentially lets big polluters nominate their own carbon emissions limits. The policy that's supposed to keep emissions from big polluters in check is called the safeguard mechanism. The government sets big polluters a baseline, a maximum amount of emissions they can produce before they're penalised. The problem is, while Australia's trying to reduce its emissions, for many companies, the baselines keep rising. If companies are not happy with that baseline, they've got flexibility to apply to increase that baseline even further. Just under a third of all facilities have increased their baselines beyond where they began initially. So there's even more headroom for companies to increase their emissions. Emissions from these polluters have gone up by 12% since 2015, according to industry analysts. Last month, the government changed the rules making it even easier for companies to nominate higher emissions limits. What incentives do facilities covered by the safeguards mechanism have to reduce their emissions under the system? In simple terms, none. And that's one of the issues with the scheme. The real way to get industry to reduce emissions is, is through a penalty, you know, through a stick. Um, at the moment, that stick is the emissions baseline and, and that limit is too high. Many in industry are working on the assumption that a future government will introduce a carbon trading scheme, making them pay for their emissions. You've been operating with a shadow carbon price. You're operating on the basis that your baselines will be going down. Yeah. Would it be easier for you if there was some sort of carbon trading scheme here in Australia? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I, I expect in time we will see a carbon trading scheme. Um, and that's why we're working we're working hard to reduce our emissions. Carbon policy uncertainty has been the single biggest obstacle to us being properly on the road to a low emissions economy. Industry is crying out for policy predictability. Agriculture is the fourth biggest contributor to our emissions, nearly 15% of the total. Emissions have gone down because of the drought, but in normal times, it's a hard area to find cuts. Methane from livestock is the biggest problem. Each day, Australia's more than 90 million sheep and cattle produce vast amounts of the potent greenhouse gas. Which steer is going in chamber one? Uh, chamber one will be 28. Rob? There's a waste product produced, which is methane. It's at the front end of the digestive system, so 95% is belched out and exhaled out throughout the day. Near Townsville, Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO, is searching for a solution. The scientists here have been testing these animals' methane levels in airtight chambers. They've discovered the key to fixing what comes out is changing their diet. 
this is the version that's been oven dried. There's a, a piece of coral right there. So we, we don't want that in there. Scientist Dr Rob Kinley is part of a team that found a variety of seaweed which cuts methane emissions to almost zero. This very special seaweed called asparagopsis was eliminating methane from those fermentations. All the seaweeds were doing a little something, but this one was rather unbelievable. We've just started measuring and we're reading 34.6 parts per million of methane. Farming the seaweed in commercial quantities and getting it into the diets of pasture-fed animals are big challenges. We still have lots of questions we're going to answer. We need a lot of um, new technology to come on board to make feed additives available to pasture-fed animals. That's something we'll be working on going forward. The way I see agriculture as part of a global strategy to meet the Paris Agreement's goals is that slow and steady is better in agriculture, whether it's in Australia or in India. Um, we need to look at measures that move forward slowly, that bring the farming community along, and that produce lasting and sustainable solutions. Electricity is the biggest contributor to our emissions, making up about 34%. They're trending down because there's been a decrease in gas and coal-fired power and a boom in renewables. Within electricity, things are changing relatively fast. We're getting a wave of renewable energy coming in, wind and solar, making up for the closure of the Hazelwood power station and making advantage of the fact that wind and solar power have become really very cheap compared to previous years. This solar farm in Colliambly in New South Wales can power up to 65,000 homes. Why is Australia such a good place for renewables? Well, look, look at the resources the country uh, is blessed with, like sun, wind, a lot of space, uh, and, and a need for a cleaner, uh, with less carbon um, economy, industry. Uh, that's a perfect, perfect combination. When French company Neoen came to Australia in 2012, it saw a land of opportunity. We looked at the availability of land, resources, uh, the policies for renewable energy, and back then in 2012, that was quite promising. So we decided to start developing solar farms and wind farms, and here we are six years later. We are the leading independent renewable energy producer. Australia is huge for us. It's half of our installed capacity globally. But since then, government support for renewables has waxed and waned. Investors are feeling uncertain. I think what is needed is a long-term goal for the integration or implementation of renewable energy. A long-term goal is not a burden. A long-term goal is a certainty that there will be more and more cheap, sustainable and re reliable electricity injected into the grid. And investors, uh, like consumers, need to understand what is going to happen in their foreseeable future. This solar farm was built in record time, less than 12 months. But renewable projects are starting to hit hurdles. The first problem is transmission. Projects are struggling to get connected to the electricity grid. Best locations for renewable energy, both in terms of solar parks and wind parks, are not necessarily where the existing transmission lines are. Right? And so we'll need to build new transmission. And there's complex questions around who pays for that um, and who decides where these new transmission lines will go. And you can see again, down here in between Sydney North and Sydney East, there's another line out, 959. Here in the control room of the New South Wales network operator Transgrid, every megawatt of energy in the system is closely monitored. And you can see down this end here, Paul, we're sending 212 megawatts into Victoria. So there's the grid is rapidly becoming outdated. The shift towards renewables has happened very quickly. It's been 30 years since we last connect this much new generation to the system. 
and then it was all coal. Now it's all renewables. When was the last time you connected a coal-fired power station? 1992. Um, the other thing that we're just keeping an eye on today is there's some constraints over here that we're managing as well. The grid is not being upgraded fast enough to accommodate all the new renewable projects that want to connect. The biggest challenge we're facing at the moment is the number of applications to join the grid exceeds the capacity of the grid to meet those applications, to supply to all of them. So it's a priority question. How do we, how do we prioritise who gets to join to the, to the grid? The next challenge is storage. And if you want to transition over time to a renewable future for energy, then you cannot do it without stations like this. The government recently promised more than a billion dollars towards this, the Snowy 2 Hydro Scheme. It's like a big battery. It essentially stores energy for when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. What we're talking about here is reliable, renewable energy. To get the most benefit from Snowy 2, there needs to be more renewables in the system. The Coalition has backed the plan, but Labor's demanding to see the business case before it commits. The proposal for a very large pumped hydro scheme, the Snowy 2 proposal, of course would be a tremendous reassurance for renewable energy to operate efficiently into the future, but not until it's actually built. Right now, Snowy 2 sits there as a potential, and if it's built, it will eat the lunch of many other storage plants. If it's not built, then many other storage plants do need to be built. So we need certainty about what will happen uh, with that state-led investment in Snowy. Right now, about two-thirds of Australia's power comes from coal. Many of our coal-fired power plants are old and due to close in coming years, like this one in Liddell in New South Wales. For the coal-fired power stations, we need to ensure that there is orderly exit. If nothing is done and if it's left completely to the market as it is, without any guiding policy framework, then we will get a very messy period that can last decades. The politics of climate change are becoming a major rallying point ahead of the May election. We need to keep going. The fight is not over. The coalition is split on whether to support new coal-fired power stations and extend the lives of old ones. We still do not have a science-based climate policy in this country and we still do not have leadership on climate from our elected representative. Shame. And I think we need to really put these things first when we vote because our future, our children's future and our grandchildren's future completely depend upon this, you know. So today I want to focus on our ongoing plan to address climate change with practical solutions that reduce carbon emissions. To address criticism it isn't doing enough, in February the government launched a $3.5 billion package. It includes $2 billion for a key part of the Direct Action Plan, the Emissions Reduction Fund. I'm announcing today a new Climate Solutions Fund to carry forward the work of the government's Emissions Reduction Fund that sat at the heart of our Direct Action Initiative when we came to government in 2013. With an additional two... The ERF uses taxpayer money to buy carbon reductions through activities like tree planting. Thank you very much for your attention. But industry modelling shows the reductions bought by the fund to date are projected to be wiped out by rising emissions from industry. We need to have a cap on industry emissions so that what the emissions reduction fund purchases actually becomes an emissions reduction. At this point, the emissions reduction fund is buying abatement, but it's only sort of running to stand still to catch up with what industry emissions are doing. And there are questions about some of the projects covered by the Emissions Reduction Fund. 
the three largest types of project are human-induced regeneration, which is uh, planting trees, uh, avoided deforestation, which is paying landholders not to clear their land when they already have a clearing permit, and the third being uh, the landfill gas sector. At this landfill near Canberra, the waste company Veolia is getting paid through the fund to use methane from this garbage to generate electricity. It sells that power to the grid. The company admits it doesn't need the taxpayer money for it to be viable. It's a component of the investment, but it's not the underlying reason for the investment. If, it, if the Emissions Reduction Fund vanished tomorrow, would you still keep doing what you're doing? We would. Activities like this have been called anyway projects. They would happen anyway without the taxpayer funding. The question is, how much more money do they deserve to keep doing this? There's no sign that the project is going to collapse without government funding. It's already quite commercially viable. Certainly, if we throw money at all of our sectors in Australia, at the scale that we've thrown it at the landfill sector, it's going to cost a lot to start to reduce our emissions and take our Paris targets seriously. In February, the government released its latest greenhouse gas data. In the last quarter, emissions went down, but since 2015, they've been rising year on year. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, the Environment yes, Minister, yes, Melissa Price, is dismissing that long-term trend. Have, have you been misled? Have emissions gone up or down? But well, if you have a look at the data in the last quarter, they've gone down. But over the, over the year, they've gone up. Over the past year, they've actually gone up. I'm focused on the good news. Minister Price refused to do an interview with Four Corners for this story. The government's plan to meet its Paris target is controversial. It's relying on what are called carryover credits. These are carbon credits left over from the soon to expire Kyoto Climate Agreement. Using them means Australia doesn't have to cut its emissions by as much. The best analogy perhaps is if someone does pretty badly in their final high school exams and then comes around and claims that they did really well in year seven and year eight and please can I have some credit for that to get a better final grade in their high school certificate. If Australia uses those Kyoto units for the Paris Agreement, it subtracts from the action that would be required to do or would have to do. So it's a way of avoiding action. So if Australia uses its Kyoto carryover credits, how much does it reduce that, say, 26% target to? Well, roughly speaking, um, it would reduce that target to between a 12 and 13% reduction, I think. So it would almost halve it? Almost half the target from a... 26 to 28% reduction to a 12 to 13% reduction, yep. My worry about using the accumulated Kyoto credits for compliance with the Paris Agreement is that this will really not have traction in the international community. It will not be taken seriously um, as uh, showing that Australia is truly taking action here. It really risks that we will be seen uh, to be making excuses. We're not just ready to take action here, we are impatient to take action. Labor has set itself a much more ambitious emissions target, a 45% reduction from 2005 levels by 2030. Yes, we are a small nation, Deputy Speaker. How would you intend to meet that target by 2030? Well, uh, we've taken a view that different sectors of the economy require different policies, policies really on a horses for courses basis. So we've announced our energy policy that would see our shift to more than at least 50% renewable energy by 2030. We need to see it in the electricity sector, which must lead because it's the biggest source of carbon pollution in the economy. But we need to see it in transport, in industry and in the land sector as well. Labor says it doesn't intend to use the Kyoto credits to make meeting its target easier if it wins government. Cop-outs and accounting tricks are no way to meet our domestic and international commitments to reduce carbon pollution.
Amid the paralysing national debate over climate policy, on the doorstep of Parliament House, a green revolution is underway. We trial our first couple of electric buses, like the one we're on. They've actually performed pretty well, we're happy, but uh, actually getting larger scales of it is harder. No one's making lots of them in this part of the world. In 2016, the ACT government committed to 100% renewable energy by 2020. And the climate change minister says it's on track to get there. Next on the list is clean transport. It's our next big sector beyond 2020 that we have to deal with. Because we have 100% renewable electricity, using electric powered vehicles is a really greenhouse friendly way of doing our transport. Here, the government is leading by example. By next year, more than 100 cars in the government fleet will be hybrid, electric or hydrogen. There's no single easy silver bullet to cutting emissions. It's a whole lot of small changes. And while they disagree on how to get there, all sides of ACT politics support the renewable energy target. Broadly, our opposition has supported the targets, uh, and that has certainly helped. I think they've been, in some ways, forced to. The Canberra community is really behind this. It means the politics on this has not been as divided as you've, as you've seen at a national level. Many Australians don't realise the current Paris target to cut carbon emissions is only a starting point. Under the agreement, countries are expected to increase their targets over time. The first deadline is next year. Every country is meant to be taking every five years a major step forward to upgrade that level of ambition. That's how it works. Now, if countries don't do that or don't act on what they've committed to do, then it undermines the spirit of what is essentially starting out as a voluntary agreement. And so, as early as next year, Australia is supposed to announce a more ambitious target. That's right, and that's what the big international effort is about now, is for countries to come forward by 2020, which means effectively the end of next year, with increased ambition. The ultimate goal of the Paris Agreement is to avoid dangerous climate change, and that implies keeping global temperature rise to below two degrees. That is a massive challenge for the planet. That means ultimately net zero emissions for the planet in the long term, and it means very deep reductions, not just to 2030, but beyond. Decades after the world first decided to act on climate change, Australia still doesn't have agreement on how to reduce its emissions, nor by how much. Climate change has become a political football, and our message right from the start, as clearly as we can make it, is that we want bipartisan support for a strategic approach to reducing emissions that aligns with what the science is telling us that we should be doing, because we're not seeing leadership on climate change at the moment. Australia's lost at least a decade, maybe 15 or 20 years, but at least a decade. I'm optimistic, though, that Australia can really catch up. When I talk to people from all walks of life, you know, I get the same story. We want to do something about this, we can do it. I'm optimistic that once this toxic political debate is over, that the economy, people will move forward and take a lot of advantage out of this.